Hello everyone. My name is Abby Brown and I'm a professor in intellectual property law at the University of Aberdeen and I'm also the University Dean for Student Support. Before I returned to academia, quite a long time ago now, I was a practitioner in intellectual property and commercial litigation in London and in Melbourne and in Edinburgh. I'm delighted of the opportunity to speak to you today about a topic which is very close to my heart and I would suggest is important to all of us, power, rights and benefit, intellectual property rights. I'm going to speak Wi-Fi permitting for around 20 minutes and then I hope we can have some discussions. I'm so pleased of the opportunity to speak to you. Lockdown obviously has many challenges, but the fact that we're able to now explore things like this is just fantastic. And I'm also very grateful to my colleagues Fiona and Lucy, who are behind the scenes and other colleagues who are making this work. Oops, that's my... Wi-Fi, there we are, slides are working. So a quick overview, I'm going to be exploring what intellectual property rights are. This might be something that you are very aware of already or it might be new to you and why I think they're interesting and also important from a commercial and also from a wider societal perspective. So what are these rights? Firstly, they are a legal right. They give you power. They are conferred by the state. They give you the exclusive right to control specific activities. It's often said they're a monopoly. If there's any former students out there, they'll know I don't really like that term. They give an exclusive right to control specific activities. People cannot do this without your consent for a limited time, with some exceptions, and in a specific country. So that is an important point. You get this right if you meet thresholds. Broadly, this is if you're clever enough, if you've done something new, if you've shared enough of your knowledge, if you've written a new book, a new song, some software, or if you've, say, developed a brand. So putting this into pictures, and I must remember to acknowledge the people who took these photos. Some of them were taken by me, also later in this presentation, and some were taken by others. So we see intellectual property rights, patents, a light bulb is a classic example of what one sees as representing innovation. And here we have one more related to green energy. We have the Coca-Cola bottle, a classic brand name. We have pharmaceutical drugs and we have a good old fashioned pile of books, which I think are still so important. So copyright, trademarks, patents underpin all of these. So why do we have these rights? Well, they're granted by states and since the late 1990s, we have states who are members of the World Trade Organization, which is most countries, they have to have intellectual property rights. And if they don't, this could lead to trade sanctions. But intellectual property rights are a lot older than that from about the late 19th century. It tended to be that once countries had reached a particular stage of development, they joined an international intellectual property treaty. Before that, in the 15th century, Venice had its own legislation protecting and they did call it monopolies. But even before that, there's long running theories, different, sometimes conflicting theories from say, natural rights, from utilitarianism, that if you didn't give someone the right to control the results of their innovation and creativity, then would they really bother to invent something? And even if perhaps they would, they might still want to develop a new drug, they might still want to write a book. Would anyone invest in it? Would anyone build a lab? Would anyone develop the printing press? And there's also the fact that if one accepts that not everyone is certainly going to innovate or create simply because they would like to or for the good of wider society, no one has actually come up with a better way to encourage and reward innovation and creativity than through intellectual property rights. That may be said, intellectual property rights are incredibly contested. There are views that give too much power, they're in views that they do not in fact encourage innovation and broadly that they take into the private domain solutions and innovations which should be available to everyone. So just to draw together some points that I've already made, when I say intellectual property rights, what do I mean? So classic ones are patents, copyright, trademark, designs, 
plant rights and often trade secrets. In one view, they're not really intellectual property rights, but say the formula for the Coca-Cola bottle, um, for the Coca-Cola, that secret, the Coca-Cola bottle and the squiggly writing is a trademark. So these are what tend to be called intellectual property rights. If you only remember one thing from what I say to you today, they are all different rights, subtly different. And if you do choose to come, I very much look forward to discussing this with you. Please do not say you patented a trademark. I know we see it all over the media. I'm afraid it's just not right. So we've explored the rights. What about the power? First of all, the power you get is intangible. You can't see it. IP rights give you the power to reward the innovation, the cre creativity and the investment. They give you the right to prevent someone copying the book or making the drug. And this can actually be so even if you have bought that book and you would like to photocopy it or scan it, or you would like to sell that drug because you've already bought it yourself. It's intangible. It's about can anyone engage in in activity with the results of the innovation. It's distinct from the physical product. And the, the classic example is, say, postcards of a work of art. You might own the work of art. You might also find that there's lots of postcards that are still being sold about it quite properly. In theory, intellectual property rights are not about controlling raw materials, natural discoveries and raw information, but there's lots and lots of debates. Sometimes one sees a symbiotech innovation, for example, in relation to the BRCA gene innovation, sometimes in relation to software. There's a lots of concerns. It's perhaps some patents are getting too close to controlling raw materials, which one can argue is objectionable in itself, but also it means that other people cannot innovate with those materials either. So IP means that the IP owner can stop you doing these things. A, anyway, or B, unless you pay them the money that they would like to have. Now, again, this can be very fairly seen as the reward for the investment in creativity and perhaps past failures. But it might mean that if you can't afford to pay, then you're not going to get the benefits. And if we're looking at an essential innovation, that can be seen as very, very concerning. So sometimes it's rather fun, I must say. I say I spent 10 years as an intellectual property litigator. I did some cases about how you make CDs. I did some cases about names for toffee spreads. Very, very intellectually stimulating, but probably not the most important things in the world. However, as I've indicated, disputes and discussions regarding intellectual property can go much more deeply. And that's why I've chosen these images here. We have the image of light, of a solution, a problem of solving a problem. And then we also have the money. Now, these are not necessarily inconsistent, but they can be inconsistent. One can certainly frame a problem as a solution to a problem for the benefit of all, being prevented by someone who wants to get more money. If one frames a situation like that, and many do, query, is there any benefit which is actually arising from intellectual property rights? Are we in fact seeing a bar to people sharing from innovation and creativity? And this is how I've been spending the last few years of my life wrestling with this problem. It depends how one wants to frame it. One can say that if you see that intellectual property is a problem, some people would say in general, most people would say maybe only sometimes, some would say IP is fantastic and should never be challenged. But if you don't like it, you might see the cavalry, the support might come from other legal fields, or perhaps there could be some intersection, some interference to assist in solving particular problems, or at its most extreme, one can see an outright clash between legal feed fields. One can certainly argue that there is a clash between intellectual property and human rights, intellectual property and competition, intellectual property and climate change, intellectual property and disability, intellectual property and sustainable development, and intellectual property 
and biodiversity. And there's some images on the screen of lots of fun I've had over the years on my own and with colleagues in exploring these issues. But perhaps the bigger problem, which I think is very important for us all to consider, and which is a really interesting area to study and research in, is maybe these areas actually just operate in parallel. They don't clash. They cannot talk to each other. One can frame arguments that they might conflict, but can you actually take this to a court to have this resolved? Do we, in fact, all live in separate boxes? Now, at one level, they don't live in separate boxes. There is a very complex balance that we are seeing. For example, one can say that there is a conflict between intellectual property and human rights because, say, very topically, COVID vaccine. In previous years, we used to talk about an HIV AIDS vaccine, cancer treatment. If someone was to develop that and refuse to share it with everyone, widely or for a reasonable fee or indeed perhaps not do it for free of charge, one can argue that this is a clash between intellectual property and the right to life. But one can also argue, and this is certainly true within the European legal perspective, that there is also a right to property over the patent itself. So simply moving into human rights doesn't solve any possible conflict. And there's also the very deep argument that, well, that's fine. You take away patent and you say everyone gets this medicine, but does that remove an incentive for any further medicines to be developed? One can also explore intellectual property and human rights in relation to rights to expression. For example, the fact that copyright can prevent people reproducing books, accessing online content, but again, what about the right to property of the copyright owner and perhaps also rights to privacy of people who might not want information about them being disclosed? A lot of my work in the Green Book and the slide that we just saw uses a case study, the concept of silent wind farms. I must confess that I, I quite like um, wind farms on land and on sea, but this is on land. But often they can be quite noisy. This can have an, an impact on people who live nearby. It can have an impact on wildlife. So I put forward a suggestion that perhaps someone might develop very silent, effective wind farms and get a patent and refuse to share, which is perhaps not quite the same as the COVID vaccine scenario, but does have some analogies. And in response to that again, we see the right to property and the incentive arguments. And this is so, even if one can also say that using silent wind farms will assist in reduction of emissions and the meeting of climate change goals. One can approach this in relation to competition. One can say that, say, particularly in the vaccine scenario or the wind farm example, that a patent owner refusing to share is in breach of competition law through abusing a dominant position or oops, there's an L missing on my slide, or there's a cartel. T two patent owners might get together and refuse to share. And in some very, very extreme cases, competition law will prevail over intellectual property rights. There have been situations when regulators and courts have forced there to be sharing. But this is extremely unusual. And in comparison with, say, 30, 50 years ago, there's now a very strong recognition in most countries that intellectual property and competition are both pursuing the same goal, to encourage innovation and encourage greater choice. One might think it is easier to frame a conflict between intellectual property and sustainable development. And certainly the goals of sustainable development might seem rather like human rights to be quite different from the com commercial reward, the investment incentive that we see in intellectual property. But also interesting to note, the sustainable development goals include industry, innovation and infrastructure. And a final point to bear in mind, which I tend to term baby in the bathwater, we could say you know, we don't care about those World Trade Organization risks. Some things are more important. We are not going to have any patents at all. But again, does this run the risk of would there be any further innovation? Prizes are often mentioned as an alternative and prizes certainly can be extremely effective. 
but perhaps there's just not quite enough money. No one has a prize, enough money to set a prize, which is probably the same as all the royalties one could get from a patent portfolio. And who says what you're going to compete towards? Some things are very clear. Again, COVID is a classic example, but more radical innovation. Perhaps we didn't know we needed the internet. We were quite happy with CDs until the iPod was developed. So relying on someone setting the targets could actually have some quite negative implications for innovation and for society. So my goal, and love people to join me on it, is to try to look at how we can combine these things in a little bit more. We have so many different areas of law which can be seen to overlap. Often they operate in parallel. Sometimes they clash and there seems to be a balance. And depending where you stand, you might feel it's extremely unfair that human rights do not have a place in this argument, or you might feel it's totally inappropriate that sustainable development should be mentioned in the same realm as intellectual property. And I've been doing a lot of work on my own and with colleagues throughout the world and in conjunction with, with some regulators to say, well, can we combine these? Can we have this golden thread, which you see on the screen, to try to help us all move forward? So that may be a different form of benefit. How might this actually be able to be done? So under the TRIPS agreement I mentioned, which is part of the World Trade Organization, there are some possibilities. They're not mandatory. Protecting IP rights is mandatory if you're a member of the WTO, although there are some traditional provisions for at least developed countries. But states can choose in some cases, to have force sharing, to have some exceptions to assist in education, or perhaps to have a research exemption. And that's within intellectual property law. What has also attracted a great deal of attention was um, another intellectual property treaty within the landscape of the World Intellectual Property Organization. And that, if we think back, that's where those 19th century treaties are still looked after. And it's a treaty for the visually impaired. And it creates a new set of obligations for states in an intellectual property treaty in relation to visually impaired people. And this imposes a mandatory obligation. And this is really the first time that there has been a mandatory exception which has been created. There's lots of rhetoric of human rights. There's lots of rhetoric of equality and also references to, to other um, human rights and disability instruments. But often these tend to be referred to but intellectual property still prevails in a treaty or the legislation, not now. So this shows that change can come. And the industry has also been very much involved in this, the publishing industry. We're also beginning to see more crossing of barriers between international institutions. Um, as you may have heard, uh, as we move hopefully towards some sort of COVID vaccine, there's been a lot of work led by the World Health Organization trying to encourage different forms of innovators to pool innovation so that everyone can move forward together and everyone should be able to share the results as we all try to move towards different forms of vaccines. Now, the World Health Organization has always encouraged things like this, but remember they don't look after IP, that's looked after at the World Trade Organization. And it's always existed, but it's been mandatory and it's been arguably seen as a little bit of an extra. But the most important thing is actually to get your patent and not share with people unless they're going to pay you lots of money. That rhetoric is not quite so appealing, I would say. Now, there's quite a few examples about this in the COVID world that public opinion is changing, corporate behaviour is changing, that this is a problem which is seen as global and trying to limit access to the solutions on the basis of corporate reward some would say that was never done anyway, but in this context, it is, we're seeing a lot, lot less than that. For those who have wanted to take a more open approach in the past, and there are many examples, particularly, say, in relation to um, more neglected diseases, for example, malaria, river fever, there are many examples of ethical licensing of a more commons based approach. And we particularly see this um, example might be Flickr, the, the, fo the photo sharing platform, I understand for some that's rather old hat now. If you go on there, you can see that work has been licensed for use by particular people 
automatically from a practical level. And we're also seeing some examples by publishers and by research funders who will say, yes, we'll give you the money, but you have to make all the information openly available to everyone. So this is again encouraging uh, a greater intersection of the idea of sharing, of pursuing other goals such as uh, towards sustainable development and human rights, as well as having your intellectual property rights. I do find it quite interesting to compare that openness to sharing with still quite often one sees a very blanket acceptance in a lot of, of government work that when we need innovation and patents deliver innovation, they certainly can, but it is not terribly questioning. And a, a lot of my most recent work explores the fact that a lot of the climate change and energy documents, they talk about technology, they don't really talk about patents, and if they do, they assume that they are a wholly good thing, which I would suggest is, is incomplete. Another area I've been working in and to um, show the breadth again of intellectual property and also the, the liveness of some of the points that we're looking at. I've been working with some colleagues um, from the Department of Chemistry in Aberdeen, notably Marcel Jaspers, and also with Professor Paul Miller, also at Aberdeen, who is the nation's favourite living composer and Dr Graham Davis um, to, to produce a song which has just been one of the most amazing experiences of my life. A song was written, we then performed it with a community choir. The link is there on the screen. I'm not brave enough to try to play it live, but hopefully you will um, you may be able to get the slides or if not you can simply search Song of the Oceans Aberdeen and you can see us singing the song. The song uses the words from a draft treaty about the treaty is exploring, as I, as I explain it to colleagues, there is a bit in the middle of the sea that no one owns. A bit that's off of, of national boundaries, for example, just off the North Sea in Aberdeen, that belongs to the UK, a little bit further right into the middle, no one owns it, and plankton and other things swim around. And scientists can use that to make really important drugs, less importantly, perhaps face cream, things like that. And mainly with a focus on conservation, sustainable development, a treaty is being developed to work out how to operate and deliver access to these resources. But also then if people again gain benefit from it, notably through say a vaccine, then who shares that? And I've been working with Marcel to argue that a solution should be developed which has regard to the interest of science, which has regard to sustainability, and which also notes the benefits which can arise from intellectual property, but also the potential disadvantages. And, and we spoke with, with Paul and with Graham, and, and they wrote us a song. And much as we would like to think that you are enjoying this, this lecture, that people read our books, many more people read and understand a message in song. So it has been an amazing thing to be able to be involved in. And the link is also there on the bottom of the screen. It's the UN BBNJ, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, BBNJ, if you would like to look that up as well. So lots of work is being done at an international level. There have been some real achievements in relation to, for example, visually impaired work and copyright. There's some very live changes at the World Health Organization and there's some very live changes in relation to marine biodiversity and drug development. There's also greater willingness, I think, to explore sharing and intellectual property rights through different forms of licensing. However, for now, I still keep coming back to the fact that if someone doesn't want to share, if I have a patent and I don't want you to use it, I can go to court and I can sue you. And the law doesn't talk about human rights, it doesn't talk about climate change. And equally, you have rights of different varieties in relation to human rights and climate change law, but you can't take them directly to court. And it's that structural difference that I find really fascinating and really quite concerning. Not least because I think it can lead to people challenging intellectual property, which I think is the most wonderful thing and it's the most fascinating area to study in and work in. So my goal is to try to move towards that golden thread to see how we can pull different areas of law together to address really important societal goals. And I'd love you to join me 
in the future and I'd love your questions now if we have time and the technology works. So please, I think my colleagues will let me know if we have questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Abby. We don't currently have any questions in the chat, but we can give attendees a few short moments just if they do have any questions to put them in just now. Please do. And just in general, the great thing about intellectual property is that, you know, you go to a party and people say you're right, people who used to go to parties now when we go on Zoom and people are really interested in it. People can understand the Coca-Cola bottle, the iron brew formula. Should we all be able to get ready access to a COVID vaccine or how much power and how much reward should the big companies have because of all the investment with which they have made? These are questions that people can understand and people can have views. And many years ago now, I did some work with primary school pupils in Midlothian. And I basically said it was the height of Harry Potter. I said, well, we're going to make a computer game based on Harry Potter, not by JK Rowling. And other companies are just going to do this. Should they be allowed to do it or should they not? And half the class went to the yes corner and half the class went to the no corner. And the ones who said yes, said yeah because everyone should be able to have a share of harry potter and the no group said because it's not fair she owns him and i couldn't have put it better by myself and there's something very deep and fundamental in the different approaches that, that we see in, in intellectual property so there's some closing thoughts um but any again if anyone does have any questions please do let me know